A story. A number of years ago, when I lived out in the Pacific Northwest, a friend of mine called and said, would you like to climb up to Camp Muir on the side of Mount Rainier, and he named the weekend. Now, being a pastor, if you ask me to do something over a weekend, it's almost certain that I will not be available. I'm often busy during this time. Uh, But as it happened, I actually was not preaching that particular weekend. And so the plan was we would go up uh, to Camp Muir on Friday, we'd spend Sabbath there, and then come down on Sunday. We gathered our things together, just the two of us. Uh, And for those of you that don't know, uh, Mount Rainier, is, uh, it's in western Washington state. It's uh, 14,410 feet tall, at least it was back then. Uh, maybe it's changed a little bit with seismic activity, etc. Believe it or not, that is actually taller than our mountains here in Michigan. <laughs> okay, so it, I mean, it's, there's a lot of elevation there. And Camp Muir is uh, about, at about 10,000 feet. So we drove up to a place called Paradise. It's uh, in the on season, you can, you know, it's a launching off point for for hikes and uh, snowshoeing and whatnot, some facilities, food. When we were probably, oh, I don't know, half an hour away from Paradise, we we encountered whiteout conditions. I mean, the snow was, you you could hardly see, you could barely see the road in front of you. So when we got to the parking lot at Paradise, we were almost the only ones there. I mean, you know, only fools would be trying to climb on that day unless you are navigational geniuses like we were. Okay. So we got out of the car and the snow is still blowing around. We get all of our gear together. I was on snowshoes. He was on uh, cross-country skis. They put skins on them. Uh, you can climb up pretty well on those. Uh, we get up, uh, I don't know, probably 6,000, 6,500, 7,000 7, feet, and you get above the tree line. And the snow cleared away, and it was actually a, a, a quite a nice day. You could see for miles up there. The sun was out. Everything was going just swimmingly until something happened that I'd never had happen before. I've never had it happen since. It was as though somebody had had flipped the switch on the wind. Out of nowhere, no warning whatsoever, I'm going to guess 55, 60 miles an hour, it just, full force, bam. Now, I can't remember if my friend fell over or not. I mean, he had skis on, so a little bit more leverage. I hit, I hit the snow. I mean, just, just right over like that. And it blew and it for, for a few seconds, and then just as quickly as it started, it stopped. Just like that. I looked up out of the snow. I said, what was that? I said, I don't know. I don't know. And get back up, get my gear back on, my pack, etc., and we start to head off again. And a few minutes later, it happened again. Switch was flipped, full force, bam, I fall over again. Now, there's no indication that this is coming at all. There's no trees, you're above the tree line, so you don't get to see any wind, you know, leaves or anything like that up there swaying, and the wind isn't getting kicked up because we're on the glacier now, and it's all frozen up there. And we kind of hope, well, maybe this is kind of a one or a two off type of thing. It was not, it went on for hours. In fact, by the time we got up to 8,500 or 9,000 feet or so, I I, I was exhausted. I was utterly exhausted. In fact, I can honestly say it is the most difficult physical thing that I have ever done. I remember thinking to myself very seriously, and I mean, it may sound kind of of far-fetched here. I mean, after all, we're just walking up the side of a mountain, right? I seriously thought to myself, is this what people feel like before they die? I mean, I, I, I have nothing left, you know, but you, you, can't, you can't spend the night out there. <laughs> uh, you're on the glacier, you're exposed, and with our tents, and with winds blowing like that, it just would have taken our tents right away. So we, we needed to get to the climbing shelter that was at Camp Muir. You know, we, we finally get up there. All, the other climbers that were coming up, they were going to summit the next day. They were already bed asleep in there. And, and believe you me, I was... I, all you needed to do was point me to a pillow. I was ready for it. I had nothing left in the tank. Zero. You know, that wind that I couldn't see, I, I, I couldn't grab it, I couldn't taste it, I couldn't stop it, certainly. That was easily the most powerful force of nature that I have ever been in outside for that long of a time. It dwarfed my puny strength, and I was utterly exhausted by the time we got to the cabin. But I want you to notice something. All of that exhaustion came precisely because I was working against the wind. 
What if I had been able to work with it? For instance, what if the goal had been to get down the mountain? Okay, I would have made it there in record time. Just, just stand still, and eventually I would get to the parking lot as it blew me down there, right? Or, or, or what about this? What if the wind had been blowing to the opposite direction, in the opposite direction, and the goal had been to get to the top of the mountain? I'm going to guess that I could have set a new world record for summiting Mount Rainier. I mean, just put one foot in front of the other and up the side you go, right? In fact, if on that mountain or anywhere else in the world, if I were to travel always in the direction of a wind of that magnitude, the direction it was blowing, the amount of territory I could cover, the efficiency with which I could move, the distances I could travel would all be far, far beyond any that I could achieve if I were fighting against the wind. In fact, it is astonishing what can be done when you are going where the wind is blowing. Welcome to part two of our continuing series, The Holy Hurricane. And those of you that were not able to be here last week for part one, let me just give you a very brief review. We started part one by asking the question, what will God's people be like at the end of time? And I suggested that the answer was passionate. They will be passionate. They will not give up. They will not stop. They will not give in. They will stand for Jesus no matter what. And we asked, well, what would make us that way? And we looked at the disciples for some cues. The disciples went from being cowards in the Garden of Gethsemane to being passionate followers for Jesus just a few weeks later. What made the difference? It was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That's what changed them. Now, what is it that the Holy Spirit does? We looked at seven things. Let me just quickly review them here for you. Uh, The Spirit, number one, convicts us of our sins. That would be bad news, except for number two. The Holy Spirit takes Christ's death and resurrection power and applies it to our lives, enables us to be transformed, to grow in grace, to become more like Jesus, teaches us all things, reminds us of Christ's words, guides us into all truth, tells us what is to come in the future. And number seven, if we are willing, the Spirit will utterly transform us into courageous, faithful, powerful, passionate followers of Jesus Christ. No wonder God says, as we pointed out then, that we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Not half, not three quarters. We are to be filled to overflowing with the Spirit of God. And this is achieved by asking for it. By asking for the filling. We looked at Luke 11, verse 11 through 13, and there Jesus told us, ask for this and I will give it to you. By giving the Spirit unlimited access to our lives, He will fill us each and every day. We are to make this our first duty. As soon as we wake up, as soon as our thoughts come online, the first thing we need to do is ask for the filling of the Holy Spirit. And then we concluded with a deeply important point. This daily filling of the Holy Spirit is fellowship with Jesus Christ and the Father every day. And consequently, it is the only possible preparation for one of the greatest events that this old world will ever see this side of the second coming of Christ. Because as I pointed out last Sabbath, and forgive me, leaving you on a cliff like that, there is still something more beyond these seven things that we just listed that the Spirit craves to do. And we need to find out what that something more is today. But before I do, I want to be really clear about something. The topic that I'm going to cover today is one of the most important topics I will ever preach on here, period. And some of you you might be thinking, oh, you're you're peaking kind of early, aren't you? And and the answer is, it's not that the other things I will preach after this, I pray, they're not going to be unimportant, but this one sits at the top of the list. Given the time that we are in in earth's history, given what needs to be done in our lives, in 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 the global life of God's people, this is exceedingly important. If we don't get this one right, we are guaranteeing that Jesus will not return in our lifetime. If we do get it right, if we implement it, if we live it, then we will be as close as you could possibly be to guaranteeing that our work will be finished and Jesus will return in those clouds very soon. So without further ado, let's get to it. What is this something more that the Holy Spirit longs to do? 
I'm going to put a series of addresses up here on the screen for you and invite you to look them up in your Bible. There's something more here. The first part here is found in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 13 to 15, page 131 in the, the Pew Bible, most of the Pew Bibles that are around you where you're at there. Page 131, Deuteronomy chapter 11. Uh, by the way, I ask you to look these up in, in a Bible. I, I'm not a Luddite. I'm not saying you should throw your iPad in the, in the sea or something like that. You can still look that stuff up on your device. And it's my experience that I remember things better from the Bible if my fingers and my brain are working together. If I can find stuff in here, it sticks better. I learn things. I can find things more easily than I can if I use an elect electronic device. So use whatever you wish, and I encourage you, if you can, to use uh, a paper version of the Bible. Deuteronomy 11, beginning with verse 13. If we're going to understand the something more that the Holy Spirit wishes to do, we've got to talk farming. You say, what do you mean? Verse 13, God is speaking. He says, so if you, meaning the, the Israelite nation, faithfully obey the commands I am giving you today to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I will send rain on your land in its season, both autumn and spring rains, so that you may gather in your grain, new wine, and oil. I will provide grass in the fields for your cattle, and you will eat and be satisfied. All right, a basic agricultural lesson about Palestine. In that part of the world, in, the, in those days, if you were a farmer, you needed the two rainy seasons very much. Uh, the, the, you could get rain most any time of the year, but there were seasons that were pronounced, two of them. One was in the fall and the other was in the spring. Uh, the purpose, uh, from a farmer's perspective, of the fall rain was to take the seed that had been planted in the soil and, and make it germinate and grow up into those early stages. Okay, so kind of the, the sprig sticking up out of the ground. And then there would be kind of this pause in the growing process until the spring in which they would pray, the spring rains would come and take that young plant and bring it to maturity so that it could be harvested. If there was no, no autumn rain, sometimes referred to as the former rain, then there, no seed would ever germinate, right? There wouldn't be anything to mature. If there were no spring rain, otherwise known as the latter rain, L-A-T-T-E-R, then there would be no harvest. You'd have these little sprigs that would be immature and not suitable for harvest, not suitable for eating. So what God is saying here is actually quite profound. He's saying to, to Israel, if you will obey me, then I will not, not only give you spiritual blessings, I will give you physical blessings. You will have food on your plates. With that in mind, turn please to Hosea, chapter 6. 10, verse 12. It's found on page 612, Hosea chapter 10, verse 12, page 612 in your pew, pew Bible. This was a very well-known phenomena in that part of the world, whether, whether you were Jewish or not. I mean, people just knew what the weather was like. There was a former rain and there was a latter rain. You needed both of them. People would pray for both of them. It was a genuine blessing that God had promised it to them that their crops would not fail. Now, notice this, Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. Uh, God here speaking through the prophet Isaiah. He says, so, S-O-W, hmm, interesting. So for yourselves, righteousness, reap the fruit of of unfailing love and break up your unplowed ground. Now, pause for just a moment. Notice what God is doing here. God is taking that which is very well known from the physical world, from the farming, agricultural world, and now spiritualizing it. You know, break up the hard ground. I, I'm going to guess this is referring to, to, to a hard heart, for instance. Br break that up. Uh, sow for yourselves not, not corn or barley or wheat, but righteousness. Sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap the fruit of unfailing love and break up your unplowed ground, for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers what? Righteousness. Not rain from the sky but a different kind of rain, righteousness. This, this the spiritualization of that which they knew. This is part of the genius of God in his teaching. The things that they could see every single day, he is now appropriating for a spiritual lesson. Let's get back just a few pages. Hosea chapter six, verse three. Hosea chapter six, verse three. It says, let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge him. 
As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like, and notice the wording here carefully, like the winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. Now, notice what God is doing here. He's not only comparing see, it's kind of general spiritual things to, to farming terms, he's now spiritualizing specifically the former and the latter rains. Yes, he says, I will bless you with physical rain from the sky, but now there's going to be a spiritual blessing, a large corporate spiritual blessing that will be like the former and the latter rains for a farmer. There will be two major outpourings of God onto his people. That's what it's saying. Now, what might that look like? Isaiah chapter 44, verse 1. It's found on page 489. Isaiah chapter 44, beginning with verse 1. Page 489. And Isaiah, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says this. Isaiah 44, verse 1. But now listen, O Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen, This is what the Lord says. He who made you, who formed you in the womb, and who will help you. Do not be afraid, O Jacob, my servant, Yeshurun, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water. Notice the rain analogy here again. I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. Now, is he talking about physical water? Is this H2O coming from the sky? Let's see. I will pour out my what? My spirit on your offspring and my blessings on your descendants. They will spring up like grass in a meadow, like poplar trees by flowing streams. So notice what we have here. God has said previously he's going to send, there's going to be two outpouring of God onto his people, like the former and the latter rains, two major blessings corporately. The blessings of the Spirit coming to an individual, the Bible says an awful lot about that. It doesn't say so much about this corporate blessing we then discover that not only will there be two outpourings of God, we get a hint as to what that outpouring will be constituted by, the Holy Spirit of God. If this is true, then we should expect there to be a massive outpouring of God's Spirit at one season, at the beginning of something, because that's what the former reign is for. And we should expect a massive outpouring of God's Spirit to bring spiritual things to maturity because that's what the latter rain is for. Hmm. Joel chapter 2, verse 28, please. Page 615 in your pew Bible. Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. The prophet Joel here, being the mouthpiece of God, has this to say. Verse 28, it says, and afterward I will pour out my spirit. Again, the rain analogy is here. I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. All right. This is a description of a massive corporate blessing. This is not an individual. This is not two or three people. This is a massive outpouring that's being promised here of the Holy Spirit. If only we had a date for it. As it turns out, we do. Look in your Bible, please. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Acts chapter 2, verse 1, page 733 in your pew Bible, page 733. Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. Now, in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, we actually read this last week, but let's read it now with new eyes, and then we'll read a little bit more. Page 733, verse 1 of Acts 2, it says this, When the day of Pentecost came, they, the disciples, were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, This massive outpouring of of the Holy Spirit, this is a loud thing. Thousands of people gathered outside of the house to see what all the commotion was about. Some of them speculated, oh, maybe all the noise is coming because people are drunk and you're racking inside. Look down at verse 14. Then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then he quotes from Joel 2. 
28 and 29. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. Let it be clear. This outpouring of the Holy Spirit on God's people It is so massive that it literally births the Christian church into existence. Praise the Lord. And remember, the prophecies that we just read, and there's some other ones as well we didn't have time to get to. In the Old Testament, they foretold that God's Spirit would be poured out in large portions on His people in both a former and a latter reign. There would be two major outpourings of the Spirit of God. Surely, Acts 2 must qualify as the first. It started the entire movement that we have the privilege of being a part of today. And if in the book of Acts that is identified in Acts chapter 2, if that first outpouring is indeed the former reign of the Holy Spirit, then when should we expect the second outpouring, the latter reign of the Holy Spirit? Turn in your Bible again, please. Revelation chapter 18, verse 1. Page 832. Page 832, Revelation chapter 18 beginning with verse 1. When will this latter rain experience come? When will the Holy Spirit be poured out in this vast, abundant measure? Notice this, chapter 18, verse 1. John says, After this I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. Now, pause right there, please. If you've studied Revelation chapter 14 and the three angels' messages there, you know that God uses angels to represent movements, a mighty movement of his people. Angels probably could do a whole bunch of stuff better than we could do, but God has not entrusted the proclamation of the gospel to angels. He's entrusted it to us. And so the angels represent us as messengers of the gospel, including here in Revelation chapter 18. And notice carefully, it says here that this message is so powerful that it lights up the planet. Okay, you can, you can buy a pretty good flashlight in a hardware store, but you will not find one that comes even close to that, okay? The idea of, of one message blowing up the planet with light, I mean, going around it, go around the globe, circumnavigating every person having this opportunity. There is nothing, no text that comes close to this type of imagery here. This is a massive outpouring of, well, let's keep reading. Verse 2, with a mighty voice he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a home for demons and a haunt for every evil spirit, a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird, for all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. Do you see what's happening here with this fourth angel, as it's sometimes referred to? This is the gospel going out to the world. You see, at the end of time, Babylon, one of of its root meanings is confusion, spiritual confusion. At the very end of time, Religious political entities on the planet gather together. They join forces for the purpose of seeking to enforce a counterfeit gospel, a forced gospel that is not the gospel of Jesus Christ at all. In the face of that comes this call, come out of her, my people. This is the gospel going out to the world. And the only way that the gospel can be understood is if the Holy Spirit interprets it for you. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. So if the entire planet has the opportunity to hear the gospel, the only explanation is that this is a planet-wide outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God. Small wonder that so many students of the Bible have concluded that this in Revelation 18 is none other than the latter reign of the Holy Spirit. Let me read to you something here from the book Great Controversy. I'm going to read some excerpts from page 611 and 612. Speaking about this time, here's what she says. She says, the angel who unites in the proclamation of the third angel's message, this is Revelation 18, verse 1, is to lighten the whole earth with his glory. A work of worldwide extent and unprecedented power is here foretold. The work will be similar to that of the day of Pentecost. 
as the former rain was given in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the opening of the gospel to cause the upspringing of the precious seed, so the latter rain will be given at its close for the ripening of the harvest. The great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of the power of God than marked its opening. The prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former reign at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter reign at its close. And then she describes what it will be like to be alive at that time. Servants of God, with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration, will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. By thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning will be given. Miracles will be done. The sick will be healed. Signs and wonders will follow the believers. Satan also works with lying wonders, even bringing fire down from heaven in the sight of men, Revelation 13, 13. Thus, the inhabitants of the earth will be brought to take their stand. The message will be carried not so much by argument as by the deep conviction of the Spirit of God. The arguments have been presented, the seed has been sown, and now it will spring up and bear fruit. The publications distributed by missionary workers have exerted their influence, yet many whose minds were impressed have been prevented from fully comprehending the truth or from yielding obedience. Now the rays of light penetrate everywhere. The truth is seen in its clearness, and the honest children of God sever the bands which have held them. Family connections, church relations are powerless to stop them now. Truth is more precious than all besides. Notwithstanding the agencies combined against the truth, a large number take their stand upon the Lord's side. (laughs) What an incredible time to be alive, amen? Amen. To be able to see all of that, to see, to see Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 exceeded by what God does through his people. I mean, miracles will take place. The dead will be raised. People will be healed from their sicknesses, exceeding what happened in Acts chapter 2. And most importantly of all, the world will be brought to make a decision for or against Jesus Christ. And the influx into the church will be massive because the latter reign of the Holy Spirit will at last have come. But let us be clear, none of this will come to pass unless the latter reign of the Holy Spirit comes first. In fact, it is completely correct to say that unless the latter reign of the Holy Spirit comes, Jesus is guaranteed to not return in my lifetime. Unless the latter reign of the Holy Spirit comes, my ministry and yours too is guaranteed to end with our physical death. Unless the latter reign of the Holy Spirit comes, the work of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in this state, in this country, and in every country around the world will never be finished, period. So we need it. (laughs) We must have the Holy Spirit. We must have it. And praise the Lord, God is clear that we can. Notice this, Review and Herald, March 19, 1895. She says, the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the church is looked forward to as in the future, but it is the privilege of the church to have it when? Now, Now, she says, now. Seek for it, pray for it, believe for it. We must have it, and heaven is waiting to bestow it. And I hope by now that the question is just burning its way through your brain. Okay, okay, I get it, I get it, Pastor Shane. We need it. How do we receive the latter reign of the Holy Spirit? It is tempting to say that perhaps receiving the latter rain is the same as receiving the former rain. Maybe all we need to do is, is ask for it. To which I would say, nearly true, nearly true, if, if we understand what asking for the latter rain really means. Uh, Brief review. Help me out here. Uh, Spiritually speaking, what is the purpose of the former reign? What's its purpose? To germinate the seed. That's right. Get get things going. Get get things started, right? And spiritually speaking, the latter reign is for something more. The latter reign is is to bring the seed to maturity. That's right. That's, that's That's the operative word there. Maturity so that it can be harvested. Exactly. That's what it's for. 
and the power foreshadowed here in the latter rain that brings this type of maturity on, on this corporate scale, it is almost unimaginable. We have never seen anything like it. And so to me, the conclusion is inescapable. With this kind of power being promised to his people, God cannot simply give it with no conditions. And you wouldn't give it either. I mean, let's think about this. If you're going to endow somebody with, to be a part of this massive, powerful thing, you would want these people to be ready. You would want them to be trained. You would not want them to be trying to misuse this type of thing. You would want them to be qualified to cooperate with the most powerful entity in the universe being active in ways that will have never been seen on the planet before. And add to this what we said in part one. We are not robots. God's spirit isn't just to come in and kind of turn us into a program and we just kind of do what he tells us to do. No, God instead invites us to be friends with him consenting, intelligent co-workers with him in the final, and again, global gospel work. And you cannot just give that kind of power away to free moral agents who have not freely and firmly decided for Christ. In fact, if you just dispensed it willy-nilly, it would harm us, it would harm others, and it would certainly not lead to the second coming of Christ. So God in his love and mercy is instead looking for Christians who are ready to receive that kind of power. And therefore, the requirements to receive the latter reign of the Holy Spirit, corporately now, I'm not talking about individually, corporately, as a people, these requirements reflect a deeper kind of asking for the Spirit than the former reign did. And so important are those requirements for receiving the latter rain that we will dedicate all of part three to finding out what they are. Two weeks from now, all of part three will be talking how to receive the latter rain corporately of the Holy Spirit. But until then, all I can say is I'm excited. I am excited by the potential of seeing the promise at last come true. The latter rain of the Holy Spirit is coming. You, you realize that, right? I mean, it's, it, it, the question is, will we be involved with it? Or will it have to wait another generation? So it's coming. The Holy Spirit is coming. The latter rain is going to be poured out. You and I and all of us, we can be a part of it. Jesus can return in our lifetimes. Because remember, it is astonishing what God can do in and through us when we are going where the wind is blowing. And I'll tell you what when God's Spirit is going to be working through us in those latter rain power days, He won't merely be working in and through us. He will be winning in and through us. May each one of us be ready for that day. Before you go, let me take just a moment to share with you an opportunity to get into the Bible in a fresh, new way. All across the world, more and more people are hearing the call to examine the Scriptures for themselves. If you felt drawn to learn more about God's Word, but you don't know where to start, or you're just looking for a more in-depth examination of Bible truths, then I have something right here that I believe you're going to enjoy. I would like to send you a series of Bible study guides. Each of these study guides asks and answers very important questions, such as these examples right here. Why does God allow suffering? Can God be trusted? Each of the initial five guides begins with a story to introduce the subject. Then, through a series of focused questions, you'll soon be learning portions of the Bible you may never have known before. And when you're through, you'll be able to share with others these inspiring truths from God's Word. Just call our toll-free number. It's on your screen now. 877, the two words, His Will. Friendly operators are standing by to send you these guides. Once again, that's 877, His Will. Call that number. And don't forget to join me next week right here at this same time.